Recording. You're gonna have to hit okay. Got it. Can you? Yes. All right. And let's hide. Hide the floating panels. Get that out of the way. Um, we don't need to see. Okay, here we go. All right, very interesting stuff this week. Um, I think you know, it, it's a it's a it's a mixture. I mean, a mixture. It's a real. Um, I think it goes a lot to American American uh, thought process. How we talk about freedom. Do you have the freedom to do whatever you want, whenever you want? Um, can you be free to do something you're not supposed to do? Um, so uh, let's get let's get into it. There's a case in the 1850s. Um, we'll, we'll, we will watch the video and afterwards we will discuss the case. Check out this video. No video. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, people were brutally kidnapped from Africa and forced into slavery in the American colonies. By the mid-19th century, however, the United States was fiercely disunited over the practice of slavery. The southern states built their entire economy on the exploitation of people as slaves, whereas the northern states had abolished the practice as a contradiction to the right of every human to be free. This friction led to the Civil War of 1861. But just four years shy of the war, and just eight years before slavery was permanently abolished throughout the United States, a Massachusetts court faced a slavery case with an unusual twist. The defendants were a white couple, Lewis and Laura Sweet, who lived in Nashville, Tennessee, where slavery was still legal and prevalent. During their travels, the Sweets were in the habit of taking along their black slave, a lady by the name of Betty. In 1857, the Sweets toured Canada and various northern states, but when they arrived in Lawrence, a city in the abolitionist state of Massachusetts, they ran into trouble. Local anti-slavery activists recoiled at the sight of a woman of color accompanying her white master and mistress. They demanded that the Sweets set Betty free. The couple claimed that they would not retain Betty against her will, but that Betty was not seeking her freedom. The activists then turned to Betty. They begged her to assert her rights and to refuse to return to Tennessee with the Sweets. But Betty brushed them away. One Lawrence activist, a widow named Lucy Schuyler, petitioned the Boston courts to intervene. The case, referred to simply as Betty's case, was heard by Massachusetts Chief Justice Lemuel Shaw, a deep thinker with considerable influence on the development of American law. Shaw requested the party's consent to interview Betty in private. He reported, I proposed and had an examination of the said Betty, apart from the said suite and wife, and all other persons, upon which it appeared to me that she is 25 years old, intelligent, and capable of judging for herself, that she has a husband in Tennessee and other relatives, that she is much attached to Mr. and Mrs. Sweet, is very well treated by them, and desires to remain and return with them. And this desire she expressed decisively and upon repeated inquiries. I explained to her her right to freedom and protection here, and that she could not lawfully be taken away against her will. The judge found himself in a quandary. Under the laws of his state, slavery was illegal and wrong. On the other hand, Betty insisted that she wished to remain with her masters. Betty's freedom appeared to be pitted against her free choice. Judge Shaw opted for the free choice argument. It was contrary to all the principles of freedom that this or any other person should not exercise a free choice in such a matter. Betty was entirely at liberty to exercise her free choice, and no one could interfere with her without incurring a personal liability. Wherefore, it was ordered and adjudged that the said Betty be at free liberty to remain with Mr. and Mrs. Sweet, or go elsewhere at her free choice, and that all persons be interdicted 
and forbidden to interfere with her personal liberty in this respect. The underlying dilemma of Betty's case rings louder and lingers longer than an individual judge's decision. Should an individual be free to choose to be a slave? Okay. So we got a very, very interesting case over here for Michael J. and um, and Ira just walked in. So the case is, a, you, have a, you have a black woman who was a slave in 1857, traveling with her white owners in Tennessee, where slavery was legal. She comes to Massachusetts. And the question is, is slavery is there, is, is illegal? Now, could they force her out of slavery? Well, she said, I want to be a slave. She had, she had a husband and children back in Tennessee. That's um, different. That's, well, that, that's the part. Your first, your first question was, can she be forced out of slavery? Yes. But what if she chooses slavery? And who cares why she chooses? She chooses. So you freedom know, means freedom means freedom to choose. Exactly. So in could today's she... climate, that seems to be the biggest argument and the biggest division is the idea that we have freedom to choose. Freedom to choose. And so you look at text number one, I um, mean, you know, it's a long text, but you guys can read it yourself. This is page 104. So Judge Shaw says that he spoke to this um, Betty and she found, he found her to be of sound mind, intelligent, coherent. She knew exactly what she was, you know, the implications of her of her decisions, the consequences of her decisions. And he said that, um, he said that she chose to go back. She wants to go back. And not letting her go back would be an infringement on slavery. I mean, infringement on freedom, sorry. Infringement on freedom. On her freedom. On her freedom. Right. Freedom to choose. So the question is, um, should a person have the right to choose, should, be, should a person be free to choose not to be free? Sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, truth is, what is it? Truth is stranger than fiction. Mm -hmm. You can't, you can't make this up. Mm -hmm. let, let, me, let me close the uh, office door one second. So, this is, um, so should there be, should there be, so now the question is, because it's not that they're making a commitment. Slavery is a commitment you can't back out of. Where are we? So slavery is a commitment you can't back out of. Maybe I should move the panel, the video panel to the other side. Ugh, this mouse, I have to get, I have to get a new piece. Either that or I need to. Hide the images? No, I won't be able to see anybody. No, I won't, be, I won't be able to, be, people to be able to see the, the writing. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm trying to get my mouse to cooperate, and it's not cooperating. Okay. Yeah, but either either it's the it's the more cheese. <laughs> yeah, I'll put it on this side. It looks like this. Okay, I might need you to. I'm, I'm leaving the mouse here. Let's move it. All right. The question is, I'll come back. Okay. The question is going back over here. Should a person be free? Choose to be a slave. So, so Michael J says yes. yes. Ira says yeah. yes. Larry says free to do as they please. But the, the, the question is, are you choosing to be a slave or are you just choosing to work for nothing? Well, it's a slave because a slave means you can't back out. This isn't choosing to be a long-term employee. You can't just walk off. Slave means you, you don't have free will. Ellen, what do you say? Um, I think it's complicated because I think they could have offered her another option, some sort of well, they emancipation paper. No, um, some kind of emancipation paper so that she had to get, she had to get back to her husband and her kids. So 
you know, she, it wasn't that she didn't, it wasn't so much that I, she wouldn't have appreciated being freed. I think she just, well, you know, in the, video, in, in the video and in, and in Judge Shaw's decision, I think it says over here, it says here in the third par in the second paragraph, smack in the middle of the paragraph, that she is much attached to Mr. and Mrs. Sweet and is well treated by them and desires mm -hmm. to remain and return with them. And, and this desire she expressed decisively and upon requested repeated inquiries. So mm -hmm. it, it, it sounds like from here that she didn't just return because her family was there. It sounds like right, she, would return, right. she would return regardless. Um, so, what right. what's, could it be that she doesn't know any better? She could have been a slave from the time she was a child. So Maybe. for somebody to say to her, you can now be free to do as you choose. Well, they did, she, they did. Yeah, but she wouldn't know how to do that. She's only known- Frame of reference for it. I see what you're saying. She, the, only, the only reality she knows is slavery. Right, so- Which going with, back, which actually we're gonna reference we're going to reference it in tonight's class when the Jews were slaves in Egypt. We're not going to reference this point, but Barbara brings up a point. Every time there's trouble, the Jews say, let's go back to Egypt as if it was better there. Right. Uh, what's it called? Mm -hmm. Stockholm, Sy Stockholm, Stockholm syndrome? Stockholm syndrome. Right? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if in her case, she doesn't have a place to live, she doesn't have money of her own, she doesn't have a job there right that's well, that's worse than slavery well it, it seems it seems that it seems that the people of massachusetts the anti-slave uh movement in massachusetts made petitioned her and offered her and okay and she still said no yeah she was adamant in but going in back her case is 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 very few and far between if you well, yeah. because she was treated well so you know, I got a husband. I got kids. I'm treated well. We're we're because uh, normally we place to live normally we normally we when we think of slavery, we conjure up an image of a man with a whip. Yeah. You know, and and mistreating. But maybe this Mr. and Mrs. Sweet were nice people. You know, maybe they. Uh, we may. I don't know. It, it, interesting. Okay, so lo let's look at freedom. So there are two theories of freedom. Right. There's what's called negative liberty and positive liberty. Negative liberty, you can see this in text number two. Negative liberty is the freedom from, right? You have, you have the right to be free from oppression. You have the right to be free from slavery, free from abuse. You have the right to be free from taxation without representation, right? Every, these, we, we consider these, we consider these God-given rights, right? Inalienable rights. Inalienable rights. Exactly. As cool. TJ's. No, you know, like people don't talk that way. Anymore. <laughs> um, have, you, have you ever seen the ever seen Declaration of Independence? Mm -hmm. No, only in pictures. I, I, see. I mean, you, you, you go to the, the Great Rotunda and, and you see the Constitution. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, it's cool. It's awesome. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm very glad I made, I made that trip. And my kids were like, yeah, it's a document. Then I said, no, 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 you don't understand. <laughs> um, this wasn't printed by a printer. It was handwritten. Right. Each well, one of those letters. Uh, with no emojis. Um, so the idea of distinguishing between a negative and positive sense of liberty goes back to Kant. And it, 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 beats, and it goes back to all, all the people. He says over here, this is Ian Carter, it's PhD. So... Um, there's a link that'll go out after the class with more about positive and negative liberties. But positive liberty means the freedom to do whatever you want, to recognize your purpose, to pursue your freedom to pursue a life of liberty in pursuit of happiness. So there's two different types of liberty guaranteed in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. Freedom from and to of oppression and freedom to pursue whatever life dreams. The Declaration of Independence was rhetoric of the revolution. It's not a law. It wasn't right. written in the law, but right. it is what we based the Constitution on, right. the first 10 amendments. All right. So, so, so when you think of freedom, 
Let's do an exercise, a 4.1, I think is a good one. This is, um, never been to the Liberty Bell, by the way. I had, I've never, yeah. been, never been to Philly. No, never been to Philly. All right. But what's this? It's broken. Is that it? I want to see something. <laughs> I want to see something. What, what is this? Look at all the rooms here. Exactly. <laughs> um, so page 107, I think this is a very nice exercise. The exercise is, when you think of freedom, what resonates with you? The negative liberty or the positive liberty? We'll start with Ira. Freedom from or freedom to? If you're quick in your head, what, when you think of freedom. Freedom from. Freedom from. Um, Michael J? Uh, I Come would on. say freedom from also, but I want to be contrary, so I'm going to say freedom to. Thank you, freedom from, freedom to. All right. Yeah. Ellen, what say you? Yeah. When you, say, when you think of freedom, what pops into your head? Freedom from or freedom to? Yeah, freedom to. Okay. Larry, Barbara? The bottom line for me is that I think they are both equally valid. I don't want people jumping all over me. And at the same time, I want the freedom to be able to go and do what I do okay. without bothering them. Now, Esther, Esther, just, just talk. Otherwise, I, uh, I see now the small icon. Yeah, Esther, what's up? Yeah, Rob. Well, I have another solution. It's no yes or no. It's dependent because all the process to have the um, the freedom, um, it is mean a, like a revolution or, or like a, a time for suffer. You know that could be something um, for a future. Could be uh, you need a hope. Uh, if you believe in ho uh, a hope in this situation, we believe in God when when we um, uh, live from uh, Egypt. And every single day, we have the opportunity to, to believe in a good future. So this is, could be the positive liberty. The negative liberty is the process to obtain the liberty. The process to obtain the liberty could I'm be not. very hard as well. Not only in your soul is is the process, well, in our year, it's not so difficult to obtain liberty. But in many years ago, when we were in Egypt land, to obtain our liberty, or even in the Shoah to obtain our liberty, this is, is mean one a war. So... So, so we're not we're not we're not we're not so, so much focusing on from me. The we're not so much from, focusing on the how to obtain liberty. We're talking about the right of a person. I mean, I, humanity doesn't at least now doesn't believe that you have to go through suffering to obtain liberty. Unfortunately, the history of man, mankind, mankind likes to oppress others. So to throw off the shackles of of oppression. Many times it takes it takes suffer it takes suffering, but Judaism doesn't believe that if you don't go through hardship, you're not entitled um, to liberty. Okay, let's go. Um, so, so let's go on to these. So based on based on the negative and positive liberty we, we just discussed, what do you, how do you think it would uh, um, apply to the Betty case? Freedom from, and freedom to. So let, let let's take the let's take the negative. The theory of negative liberty. Would she have the right to to choose to be a slave? No. Yeah. What? Well, no, we have no one. Yes. Well, no. I think if you tell her no, what you're really doing is you're putting a restraint on her. And freedom from means you have the freedom. From restraints, Free, uh, freedom from uh, from uh, from restraint. You know, you're negating freedom from means you're uh, freedom from negating a person's will. If now, you have no obstacles, freedom, no barriers, no constraints. You have the freedom to really decide and choose for yourself. Yeah. Now, the theory of, of 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 now, if you say positive liberty, which is the freedom to recognize your purpose, the freedom to realize your potential. And choosing to be a slave 
Well, you can't be a slave. You can't realize your potential, sorry, if you are under the dominance of another, uh, of another person. But at that time, I think it goes back to what Barbara was saying, that she, Betty, had no frame of reference as to what her full potential or purpose would have been. And you could also argue who defines what purpose. Maybe I decide, like Betty did, that her purpose is to be a slave. Or she could have been a great scientist, except they didn't really have any way for her to be a scientist then. So right. her potential well, still had, would not have been realized. She didn't have uh, being a slave she had no frame of reference to get a higher education. Right. I mean, if let's say a person sees themselves as put on earth, right or wrong, they see themselves as put here to serve. So, for, so let's say Betty finds fulfillment. So to deny her that, right. that's her freedom. She she works for a great friend, a great family in their area. That's yeah, and prestige. she and she yeah and yeah and she produces and she's you know that family gives her you know comforts and everything else and and to add even though she didn't have an opportunity to get better education that doesn't mean that she was not intelligent. The, the judge right judge uh, Shaw. Said yeah. in his words that she was intelligent. Mm -hmm. No, it's it, this case is very hard for us because obviously, 150 years since the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation, you know, when countries struggle to deal with racial inequality, see slave the word slavery and automatically, oh, wrong and everything else. So to have a case where somebody chooses to be a slave, what are you talking about? Like, I, th I thought we're, we're trying to move on from that, right? It's okay. But it is 1857. So. But isn't there also an example in the Torah yeah. about slaves? Yep. But we'll get to that. Oh, okay. I'm jumping the gun. No, 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 no. We can discuss it. Yeah, there's an example there, yeah. but it's very different. Mm -hmm. So, the, in the Torah's view, a Jewish slave is not a slave. What he really, the real definition is, although he uses the word evid, the correct translation, I think uh, you can see it in the Arya Kaplan's Living Torah translation, is indentured servant, because you're pretty much paying him for six years of work. Mm -hmm. So he has to be there for six years. He can't quit. And he lives on your property, but you have to take care of him like, like a member, member of the family, even better. Like you have to provide for him before you provide for yourself. So, and, and they could sell themselves into slavery. Only if they're repentant. Only if the the. Yeah. Okay, but in other words, if they needed the money, they could do that so that they but, could get the money to do something. Yeah, well, well, no, the money, that money went to their family. So, still, yeah, I'm saying so. There are two, there are two scenarios where a person can become a slave in the tar. Either he stole and he couldn't pay back, put him back, pay back. So the court would sell him to, uh, you know, so to reimburse the owners for their loss. Mm -hmm. Or a person was so penniless, so destitute, didn't have land or anything, didn't have any you know, real estate or assets to sell otherwise, so he could sell himself. But again, it was it was frowned upon. Yeah, let's and like I said before, for a person to buy a Jewish slave was was quite an, an undertaking because there were major, major laws that how you, how you had to treat it. Like I said, he's not really called a slave. It's really called indentured service. That's really what it is. Okay, let, let's look at what freedom means for the Torah, because this is not the Learning Institute. It's the Jewish, Jewish right. Learning Institute. All right. So we know we know that freedom is an invaluable message of the Torah. It's all over the Torah. In fact, the concept of that people are born free is something that the Jewish Bible introduced to humanity that you can't just oppress another person because you are, you are stronger. That started with the Jewish people. And where did it start with the Jewish people? It started with the Jewish people going out of, um, of Egypt, right? The Jewish people went out of Egypt on the 15th day of Nisan. Six, seven days later, we crossed the sea. We were free from the threat of the Egyptians. And that's 
is, you know, the birth of our nation. And we celebrate every year, we get around, we eat too much matzah, drink too much wine, complain about it the next day, you know, or compare notes, what time did your Seder end? But that's really, we celebrate the, the and that's why the Passover is the most Jewish celebrated holiday amongst the Jewish people, whether a person is affiliated or non-affiliated, because it goes to the very core um, uh, of Judaism. But how does, uh, but how does Judaism define freedom? What does it mean to be free? Raph, uh, yeah. Raph, yeah. I want to add something. Okay. Well, it's, it's about freedom thinking. Um, even in the Shoah, when I say we, when we were in the Shoah, because my two grandparents were in the Shoah and camp concentration, um, I, my grandma told me when she was uh, well, living because she passed that I, away many years ago, and she told me, even when I was uh, were in, in in that camp concentration, the how I was freedom because I have my um, my religion with me. So right, right. I say I I, I she say the pefilod and. Um, she was very closing to say, um, even the, the, the Shema, the Shema, she always say the Shema to be a safe, to feel right. that she was a safe. Right. So the connection with freedom is not only something physical freedom, it's more, is it about inside you? Because well, yes. so, my, so the Maharal, the Maharal of Prague writes this, he writes it actually based on the Haggadah, based on what we're going to discuss on page 108 in text uh, 3, 4, and 5, because it says uh, the Marala writes, and he lived in Prague in the 1500s, and we say in the Haggadah then, that we used to be slaves and now we're free. And he says, how can you say now we're free? We live under Christian persecution. How can you say such a thing? And he says something is, uh, with similar, uh, with, uh, similar to what Esther's saying is that once a Jewish people were taken out of Egypt. It wasn't just that their bodies were liberated from slave labor. Their minds were liberated from the concept of slavery. So he says, although a Jew physically can be put into, in, into, into he can physically be oppressed and he can physically be a slave, his mind is always free. A Jew can never be enslaved again mentally. And, 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 and um, we're going to get to that more in text number four and five. Well, text number three is very important. So it says that what makes it, what makes a person free? There's no there's no freedom. Um, only someone who occupies himself in dar. Now you might have heard me say this before. That one of the biggest problems with you know, with the Ten Commandments movie, Charlton Heston, <laughs> and, and many of the plays in the comic books of Exodus is they, they get the first part of the sentence where Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, let my people go. But they forget the second part of the sentence, which is interesting because it's in, it's in the sentence. It's, it's, it's the same part of the sentence. Moses goes to Pharaoh and says, this is what the God of the, the Israelites said, the Hebrew said, let my people go so that they may serve me. In fact, when Moses was standing on the mountain, what, what we now know as Mount Sinai, and he asked God, he said, but what merit the Jewish people are going to go out of Egypt? Why should you liberate them? And God said, because they're going to come out and they're going to serve me on this mountain. The whole point of going out of Egypt was to receive the Torah. So we see the receiving of the Torah is interconnected with, um, with the Exodus. And once the Jewish people, once they receive the Torah, God says, now you're mine. Now you can't be enslaved by anyone else. This is what I was talking about a moment ago. No matter what other human beings do to you, you're mine. You see, this is text number four, where Hashem says, because you are my servants, but I took you out of Egypt. And, and text number five, the Gemara says, when God says that we're his servants, we now serve him. We don't serve other people. Maybe physically we serve other people. But mentally, we, we, um, we can't. And that's why when I said, you asked me about a person selling themselves into slavery, I said it was frowned upon to willingly um, 
subject himself to slavery. Now the question is, um, now the question is, I'm sorry, we're getting a phone call. I'm sorry, buddy. I need you to uh, manage. I can't see that side of the phone. Okay. Wait a it says low battery. Uh oh. <coughs> we're having some technical issues. Low battery. I don't mind going low battery. Yeah, but I want to make sure that it's actually charging. Hold on. Wait, 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 one second. Let's see. Hold on, guys. Pull the wire. And... Hold on, hold on. We're going to see if we do this. Hold on. No, it's not charging. Hold on. Let's take cash. Yeah. No, it's not charging. Stop. What does it really make a difference? I brought two. Yep. All right, sorry, wait, wait, it's, the phone has a, has a low battery. I don't have a problem with this. I don't know why. It seems, it seems something's on there. Yeah. No, but it's, a... not. No, it's not. It's not. Do you have an iPhone? Right? Yeah. Hold on. Mm, no. Okay, it's two different batteries. All right. I might, I might have to get a uh, might have to get an accessory cord. Okay, but we'll go until as far as much as we can. All right. So, um, so the question is, you know, we're going to question what it says on the uh, on the board on the screen. Uh, true freedom is through Torah, but if God took us out of slavery to make us as slaves, so we're not free. We just went. From working from Macy's to working at Gimbal's, <laughs> you know, we're from working from Apple to working at IBM. What do you mean? We're still, we're still slaves. What does it mean? What does it mean that that um, laws can make a person free? Now, how could that? Is it working with you? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm wondering if it has something to do with the maybe the case. The case, and does this go in all the way? I don't know. It seems to. It should seems I read the wire. Should read the wire. All right. Uh, if you've got another wire, we can try another wire. Well, let's try one more wire. Sorry. It works because I've been using it the whole time. I just use this one in my car. Maybe. Okay, hold on a second, guys. Sorry. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Yeah, now it's ringing. Sorry. Sorry, guys. And we're back. Okay. So, so the so the question is, how can laws make you free? If you follow a Torah, you're a free person. Basically, what God's saying is. You went from one powerful guy, Pharaoh, to a more powerful guy, God. It doesn't. It, it doesn't seem. Um, it, it doesn't seem to make sense. Um, to, to, it, it, so it's like this. Rav could be contradiction, because if we want to be free, we we don't need to have uh, so rules. This is a, a, a like a, a contradiction. But if you see the Torah, not only um, uh, well, uh, a compilium of commandment or all mitzvot, this is a, a way to living. So it's not it's not only a rules. It's it's a form of, of way to live. Right. So uh, so is right. this is this really a guide a how to we can live. And, right. and, and we have to implement that guide, not just leave it abstract and nice ideas of, of peace and love and tikkun olam and, 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 just, love, and loving God. Can't leave the book on the shelf? You can't leave the book on the shelf. You got to actually eat the kosher food, you know, keep the Shabbat and all that. No, it's rules, you know. I believe in the rule. I believe in taxes. And someone else should pay them. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No one should speak except for me. Right? <laughs> but what Esther's saying, what Esther's saying is true. 
but, but well, let's let's um, well, let's talk about it this way, all right? You think you think the Jewish people were the first people to be oppressed? No. You think there were no other slaves before? You think the Egyptians invented slavery for the Jewish people? No. 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 And the Jewish people weren't slaves. Weren't the only people slaves afterwards? Well, many every times, conquered, every conquered people throughout history served the as slave to the to the uh, victor. Exactly. So many times, people look at the story in the Torah, and they think of the story like this: it was an oppressed people, and God felt bad for them, and took them out of slavery, and took them to their own land. So they could live life freely. It's a nice story. But it doesn't make any sense. Because why did God intervene then? You know what really bothers us about the Holocaust? You know what really bothers us when bad things happen? Because we read the story of the Exodus. It really starts from that story. The other story is similar, but it really starts from that story. We read the story of the Exodus. There were, these, there were these bad people doing things to good people. And there was no hope. And God, who has the power to do anything, came and took over, changed the rules of nature, did whatever, he, you know. He pulled, you know, he, he didn't hold anything back in order to accomplish what he had to accomplish. So we did it then. How come he doesn't do it now? Which is similar question of well, how come God doesn't intervene when the Rohingya Muslims or in Sudan or right? Mm -hmm. The answer is in Ukraine, right? Yeah. The answer is God didn't intervene in Egypt because the Jewish people were oppressed. That's not why. God didn't do it out of compassion for the Jewish people. That's not why. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry if I'm shattering some 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 uh, pictures you had since you were a kid. But that's not why God intervened. God intervened, took the Jewish people out because the whole reason why he took them out of Egypt wasn't to save them from slavery, was that they give them the Torah. Because the, a, a, a Jewish person's identity is the fulfillment of the Torah. And when you're slaves in Egypt, you can't do the Torah. God gave us a land, not because, so we should be able to have barbecues, whenever we want, you know, be able to go to a club with everyone. It's not why he gave us a land. He gave us a land because certain parts of the Torah are connected to agriculture. And he gave us, he gave us a holy land because holy land, holy people, um, you know, holy activities. It's not about God feeling compassion. That he's a nice guy. He is a nice guy. He is. I'm not, I don't want to take away, you know, from all the compassion, the things he did. But we have to stop viewing the Exodus from a point of God, you know, saw the Jewish people being bullied. Like, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if it's a scene in a movie or not. This kid is being bullied and this other kid comes and saves the kid from the bullies. So the Jewish people were the wimpy kid being bullied by a bunch of tough guy Egyptians. And God knew judo, you know, and he kicked the Egyptians. But and, and now God and the Jewish people are best friends. And Jewish people share their lunch money with God because they owe it. To that's kind, of, but that's that that's that's it sounds like a Hallmark Channel movie. But you know something? Well, that's the that joke. Well, kid comes home from from Hebrew school, yeah. and he's he's telling his mother all about the 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 what he learned about the Exodus. He says, "Yeah, Moses came down, pulled out an AK forty seven, and shot all this." Mother is looking at the kid in astonishment. Says, that's not what happened. <laughs> you wouldn't believe if I told you what they told me in school. <laughs> <laughs> Many times we look at the story of Exodus from the negative liberty. That God freed us from subjugations from the Egyptians. And that is true. He did do that. But that's not the why. He did that in order for us to do. The negative liberty wasn't the end. The negative liberty was a necessary step for what? For us to live a purposeful life. Ah, now who decides 
What's a purposeful life? Well, that God decides. Why? Because he's God. And he knows. How does he know? Because he created everything. So it's not that we went from one law to another law. We went from having no purpose to having purpose. The Torah is not, listen here, you're alive. And I'm going to give you a Torah in order that this life should have purpose. That the Torah is added on to life. No. Look at text number six. The Rebbe explains. He says, service of God, this is page 110, is not something that stifles the identity of a Jew. God forbid. On the contrary, divine service is the identity of a Jew. This is the meaning what the sages said, that no person is free except the Torah. Even though Torah observance has a lot of rules. Observing the Torah and, and mitzvot is the true nature of a Jew. Only when serving God is free. So let's, you know something? Let's supplement. Let's take out. Let's replace. Let's do word replacement. Instead of using the word law, instead of using the word Torah, let's say this. Would you agree with such a statement? A true, a true, a truly free person is only one with purpose. Yes, you have to have a purpose. You have to have a reason to get up in the morning. Only a person with purpose is free. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, it's freedom to realize that purpose, right? None of us would consider an addict, drugs, alcohol, whatever it is, a free person. It, they, can, they, they can do whatever they want. They're not free. Actually, they're actually compelled by their instincts and, the, and their addiction. We think, of, you know, the problem with how the American public has been, has been um, educated is freedom means you could do whatever you want. The negative liberty. The Rebbe would always say, doesn't say in the, in the freedom of a uh, declaration of independence, freedom from religion. It says freedom of religion. You have to have purpose. You get, like you said, you have to have, right? So let's take, for example, let's go through this, right? Let's take, for example, a plant, right? In order for a plant to be a plant, he needs water, he needs sunlight, he needs earth. If it doesn't have those three, it ain't free. You might go to the plant and say, you know what I'm going to do, Mr. Plant? You're stuck there in the ground. I'm going to help you. I'm going to rip you out of the ground. You're, you're not free. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? You're not, you're not freeing the plant. You're killing the plant. Now, for an animal, you lock it in the ground. Obviously, it's not good. My kids asked me the, uh, a couple weeks ago, you want to go to the zoo? I say, I don't go to zoos anymore. After going to SeaWorld and, Miami, and the Miami Metro Zoo, I'm done. You see the animals are trapped in these tiny places. I'll never forget the elephant. Miami Zoo, I'll never forget the elephant. It had this tiny, um, my mind maybe as big as the zoo. The, the Metro Zoo now? Yeah, I don't know, five, it's six, seven years ago. I went to Usually it's, the Zoo Miami is considered one of the better zoos with more are they, I, mean, I remember, the, I remember, I remember the, the elephant. Animals. I remember the elephant. Remember the elephant. Yeah. Remember the elephant. They look depressed. I don't know. They look. They don't know. look happy. The animals don't look happy. And, and and also you go to you go to Power Jungle. They have this liger, tiger. Yeah, yeah? and mm -hmm. it's in this small enclosure. They're not supposed to be there. And I remember Sea World. The, the dolphin is swimming in a small circle. I mean, what not, about that? Uh... Place up in Palm Beach, Animal King. I know, Safari. Lion Country Safari. Lion, Lion Country, Country Safari. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, even though they're, they're still locked up, you just drive around. So. Hey, they have more. They have more room. Yeah. They can run at your car. Mm -hmm. Not on Lion Country Safari. No, I don't think so. No, no, they're not. You go, you go to the real safari in Africa. Take care of your That's where you can't get up. And when I was in South Africa, so we're driving in a van, and I, we didn't know. So in order to look, because they have to look on, on the whole savannah. Sometimes they, they don't stay close to the road, you know. They mm -hmm. don't pay the animals for tourists. So, so I had the door open. It was weird. My, my brother was driving the van. I had sliding door open and with this binoculars to look for animals. We got a big fat ticket. You're not allowed to have your door open? Nope. Because an animal could jump in. 
<laughs> yeah, sure, sure, it's happened. Yeah. So an animal needs space to be free. A human being, you know, you can't just say, tell a human being, just go do whatever you want. Go have pleasure and good times. How long does that last? Sounds good when you're 10, 20, 30, right? You get, you get to a certain point where you look back and you say, hey, I had a good time, but human beings need purpose. That, that, defines, that defines human beings. So Hashem tells you, like Esther said, Torah is not just a set of rules where you know, you know God sitting up there on his chair saying, guys, guys, it's going to the angels, guys, look at this. I'm going to tell them to put black boxes on their head. Let's see if they'll do it. Oh my God, they're doing it, right? You think God's just... Yes, I'm sure that that's what happened. <laughs> right? You think God's exactly. just sitting there playing uh, pranks on us? No, there's an, it, there's an errant value in the activities themselves. And, and so much so is that person supposed to be free that a, is a rabbi from the 1800s and in Tzadik code, text number seven, he says that slavery is an abnormality. Slavery is an ab abnormality to the point that it's not natural for human beings to be a slave to them. This is what the Torah brought to humanity. Slave into another human being is not human, for you, even for the person. Not, not only talking about, so he's saying that for a person to choose slavery means that something's not functioning right. They're acting on co coercion, or maybe like Barbara said, they don't know any other reality. It's not, it, ever since the Torah taught us the concept that people are meant to be free, that people are meant to have purpose, the concept that a person should choose slavery, he says, is not is um, is, is not human. So he says it, it's impossible. Okay, let's go on to some more, some more, and more case studies. And now this is going to be a little bit more complicated, right? Complicated, but interesting. Look at text number, case study A, page number 112. This is a, a true story. This happened in the 12, uh, this happened in the 1300s. Um, and this is a story of a man, David Ruvain. He borrows money from Shimon and didn't repay the loan. Hmm. Now, he, Ruvain is living with his relative and he's living the high life, wearing good clothing, eating good food, giving out presents. And when Shimon goes to room for the load, he says, I don't have money. So what do you don't have money? All the money I have belongs to my relative. Now, Shimon wants money. But Shimon, Shimon goes to court and says, the whole reason this guy is not working is because he knows I have a lien on his on his property, any money he makes goes straight to me. So he says, so I work. Could we force Ruvain to go to work to pay back that loan? No. Cry. No. I think you can force no, him in the to court. pay back the loan. How he does it, I don't think, you know. What do you, what do you want him to steal? Uh, Only how he does it. We're waiting for waiting. Gonna call, make you an offer you. call his rich uncle. He's still alive. How are you feeling today? Good. Call up that. Sorry. I don't think you get any money today. <laughs> right. I don't know. Rav? Yeah. Rav? Yeah. Well, in Jubilee, Jubilee, and well, when we read that. Yeah, but that's it, only that's only in the land of Israel, number exactly. one. And that's only when all the Jewish people lived in Israel, number two, and that, so a Jubilee hasn't been since the end of the first temple. Um, and it also was in Shemitah, also was in Shemitah, but um, so actually, now that you bring that up, so Hillel realized that people would not want to lend money close to Shemitah this sabbatical year, because all loans are wiped off the books. 
people yeah. need loans. The economy needs money. You need loan to borrow you know, capital. So they, so they invented something called the prusbal. Prusbal is where, where you owe, well, the Torah says any money owed to an individual is wiped out. Any money owed to the government is not wiped out. So you assign a debt to the, to the government, to the court, and the court can collect the debt. Yeah, but I want to, to tell you is to say that even in, in, a, um, in the time of the uh, temple, we, yeah. we were um, slavery for them. It's not the same trait of a slavery like in, uh, well, like Egypt and in, in Egypt land. Because I, I remember in one opportunity, the Allah has said that you have to treat your servants like your family and sit right. in the I same place. Yeah. So it's, it's like a, it's like a servant. It's not the same like a uh, slavery. No, yeah. right. right. It says in the Gemara that someone who bought a slave, a Jewish slave, he really bought for himself a master because all the rules that, like if he only has one pillow, he has to give it to a servant. He has, he has to, he can't eat better food than the servant. It goes through all of it. Okay, case study number, uh, number B. Page 114. Now this, I think, is very applicable. I mean, I think you guys can... Uh, Mr. Britton signed a contract to work for Mr. Turner for one year. It'd be, it'd be paid $120. It, 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 keep in mind, the number is 1834, okay? Mm -hmm. For the uh, total, $10 a month. But he stopped working after the 10 months. That's nine months. The turn was only able to find a replacement worker for maybe three months for $45, which is $15 a month. Now, turn did not pay Britain anything, meaning he didn't pay him anything for zero. Now, Britain, the employee, contracted an employee, sued to collect pay for the money he performed. Now, the question posed to you, my dear friends and judges, how much should Mr. Britain receive? Should he get zero dollars? Because you signed the contract to work for a year. You didn't work for a year. It means the entirety of the money is due based on the entirety of the time. Or should he say, listen, you worked $10 a month. If <coughs> Wi-Fi is not connected, are we, can you guys not see it then? I'm seeing it. Yeah, they, yeah, you guys see yeah. right, right. I see it. Okay, good. So they should, but I'm not even using my phone. It's hard work. So he said, so, or she so said, listen, you worked nine months. Yeah, he promised to work 12, but he worked nine. So pay him for nine. Or do you say, yeah, you work nine. But the whole idea was, I thought I was spending $120. And because you changed the term of the employment, now it's going to cost me $135. I have, to, I have to pay $45. So that extra $15 is not going to come out of my pocket. It's going to come out of yours, Mr. Britton. What say you, Ellen? Sorry, um, I'm, I'm getting some water. Okay. I think the right answer is, is 90. You pay him for the nine months. You can't penalize him because the rate went up. You say that Mr. Britton should pay the difference. No, she said 90. No, no I, said, I said 90. 90. Sorry, I, I, I didn't hear you over the hum of their fridge. Michael J? 75. Larry? Give him his uh, 90 bucks. You can't deny him his pay. If there's no clause in the contract, if he signed a physical contract and it doesn't have any penalties in it, then he's not liable for doing anything else. If there were penalties included in the contract, then he would obviously have to uh, live up to paying the penalty. All right. Esther, what say you? I have to think more. Okay. Ira? The $90, because you don't know if there were extenuating circumstances. Britain might have gotten sick. He might have uh, had pro medical problems. So according to what you're saying, 
if there weren't ex extenuating circumstances, he should be paid seventy five. No, he should be paid the ninety dollars. Uh, if he stopped, let's say he, he let's say he stopped no working for no reason. He was he got bored. But it doesn't say that in the case. It doesn't say it doesn't say someone died or got sick either. <laughs> so let's say, for example, he realized he's not his team made it to the World Cup, to the World Series, eighteen thirty four. I don't know anything was around then, right? So now the question is, and he decided whatever whatever it is. He did the work. The work supposedly was good enough for those nine months. So wait, a contract is worth nothing? What's the point of a contract? Well, again, Larry pointed out. Again, okay, maybe there were there wasn't anything written in the contract uh, as to penalties or as to anything else. So you can't. You, we we don't have enough information. Sure so don't. I am judging in favor no, of the worker we, because we you have, decided. And I'm a union man. We yeah. have enough information. The information that we have is the contract's one hundred and twenty dollars. It's going to take forty five dollars to hire somebody to complete the term of the contract. The net of that is seventy five dollars. That's what we should get. All right. I didn't add anything in. I just took what was it. Okay. That's my one. So the reason why, by the way, I'm, I, 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 Esther, let me know if this belongs to anyone in your family. This was last year in Shul. Um, the reason why, the reason why I, uh, this is a great example, is because not paying debt, it's a big problem. Not in the, only in the ancient world, it's a big problem in today's world, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the, the most modern example is talking about forgiving student debt. Should we, shouldn't we, shouldn't we? So in, in ancient times, they had this, they had a few different ways of going about um, debt, um, debt recovery. In halacha, like I said before, in halacha, when you borrow money, all your assets are, are tied to that, that lien. It means if you don't pay cash, the court can go and seize your assets to pay back. But it, it ends at assets. It doesn't go into bondage. We don't put a person into slavery because they can't because they can't pay back um, because they can't pay back a loan. Now, you're supposed to you're supposed to pay back the loan, obviously, but only. And by the way, when I say all your assets, I don't mean we put the person on the street. That means we figure out exactly what the guy needs: housing, food, clothing, anything after that. There's no Disney World. Right, there's no, you're not entitled to go on vacation. Right, I think, like, I think down here the equivalent would be uh, homestead property is protected from bank, from, from uh, bankruptcy, from debt. Right, they can't take away, they can't take away your house. If my mom, my mom, says this in text number, text number eight. The IRS. Yeah. Take away your house. Yeah. I guess a loan. It's taxes. No, the IRS can take it because of taxes. Mm -hmm. But in, but in Jewish law, they wouldn't take away your house because of taxes. Um, so the Bermanides writes in text number eight, says that, um, the Torah says that, that when a creditor demand debt, payment for debt, that assets and all, and uh, should be um, be provided except for his, his essential needs. And um, debtor owes no assets, last paragraph, or if any assets are only sufficient to provide for the ex existential needs, nothing, nothing can be done. And that's it. You just gotta. And they may not be in prison. Not be in prison. You just gotta, I guess, get, wait for the guy to. Uh, win the lottery. <laughs> win the lottery. Pay some money. Well, yeah. If he's got two bucks to play the lottery, let him give the two bucks to the guy and pay off his debt. It may take him a hundred years to do it, but <laughs> right. So he could be the next winner. <laughs> Reminds me, you know, there's, an old, there's an old joke. His grandfather's walking with the grandson. I stop at a tombstone and say, "See this guy over here? He's a nice guy." His grandson says, "Why is he a nice guy? This guy borrowed from me five thousand dollars. He was never able to pay back the loan, but his till his last day." He worked hard to pay back that loan. Never finished. He's going to have it. Keep walking. See that guy over there? 
that guy's going to hell. So why? That guy borrowed money from me. Never even tried to pay back. He's going to hell. The, grand, the grandson says, you know, granddad, you know, you're very lucky. So why? Because no matter where you go, you'll be able to collect money. <laughs> so uh, let's go to the rush. So let's at, no, let's look at the rush's answer. The rush. So this is from text, uh, case study number eight. The rush was Rabbi Usher ben Nishil, rabbi in Germany. And then they hired him to be rabbi in Spain, and he said, and he said that, well, I think it was I said this, you can't force someone to go to work. He owes money. The court can't force someone to go to work. You mean, I mean because the Torah gives the court authority over Ruvain's assets doesn't give him authority over Ruve. Remember, going back to text number three, we are now God's servants. We don't serve anyone else. Ever since we've taken out of Egypt, our bodies can never be, don't belong to anybody. So therefore, the court cannot compel Ruve to go to work. That, that, when you compel someone to go to work, that is, that's slavery. That's the, um, that, that's enough. That, now, does Ruvain have a personal obligation? Should Ruvain, obviously Ruvain should, uh, you know, should pay back, should, you know, should pay back uh, the loan. And this, by the way, is echoed in Western law. Now, Western law also, the 13th Amendment, the abol abolishment of slavery, you cannot compel someone to go to work. Unless, unless, anybody know? Unless, what's the only time in, in, in Western society you compel someone to, you, to do work? They're in jail. Thank you, Larry. Convicted of a crime. When you're convicted of a crime, you lose all your rights. Well, when you're drafted into the army. You're not compelled to do it. That's something else. No, if you're drafted in the army and, and, and your sergeant says, go do kitchen duty, you better go well, do it or you well, have but, to the break. Yeah, yeah, but they had that in Jewish law also. The king can draft people into his army. But that's called, that's not called slavery. That call, that's called working in the military. Obviously, there has to be a cook and everything else. That's, that, uh, that's different. But the interesting, interesting example. Um, not really. So Western democracy, with the 13th Amendment, slavery is abolished, but, but for, we, we, we have till today, forced penal labor still, still exists, right? Um, what do they get, paid pennies on the dollar? Something like that. Right? The they chain get, gang. Chain gang? The chain gang. Yeah. What, what is it? I remember driving south uh -huh. New York, down to Florida, going through Georgia, oh, yeah. and you would see the chain gang working on the roads. Oh, you mean they're chained? Literally, yeah. chained. And chained. they're and working? Yep. Yep. Oh. I haven't seen it. So um, Sam Cook wrote a song about it. <laughs> and uh, so you, you see them, right? They work in factories and, um, and everything else. You t text number 10. Prison labor in America. This is 2015. How is it legal? That's Whitney Bar uh, Ben's book. Once cleared by a doctor, the, the prisoner has no has no right to say I don't want to work. He has, to, um, he um, he has to work. And this actually was written into was written into the thirteenth the thirteenth amendment. And so, but so so we have this so we have this in um, we have this concept that in Western society. And also, you have this in um, we have this in, in Jewish law. Also, you cannot force someone; you cannot compel someone. Uh, and you can't you, you can't you can't compel someone to work. Now, let's um, if, you, if you try to balance that with ancient law. In ancient law, there's something called dead prison. You heard of dead prison? The prison is your prison. Yeah, if you weren't, if you couldn't pay back. England had them all the way up to. There were, I think they were the last century. What? The, the late part of the 1800s. Yeah, they were, I think they were the last country to abolish it. The last of the Western society to abolish it. You know, Charles Dickens' father. Charles Dickens' father was put in prison because he couldn't pay a debt. 
and uh, I think Charles Dickens was put, and he worked for six shillings an hour. And and they say based on that experience, he was I mean he was very embarrassed by it. It affected a lot of his work. I think there's a yeah, text number eleven. Oh no, 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 text number something else. Um, this is from says so the debtors were sent to prison, and it says you know the families were free to come and go, and a lot of them died. They went look at this in 1942. Look at the last line, third paragraph. In 1940, 1842, sorry, when the Fleet Prison was closed, it was found that debtors were there for more than 30 years. You know, in the in the Jewish world, one of the biggest mitzvahs, and this only this mitzvah only went out of um uh let's say it, it became not really not really applicable because you know, Western you know society you know, progressed enlightened was a mitzvah pigeon sure in every single community there was a, a a rescue the captive fund this was an active fund and it was depleted because people let's say for example were not allowed to own land they had to lease the inn lease the farm if they couldn't make the rent them and a, they and the family were thrown in prison, and he ratted there until, you know, it, until they earned enough money to get out. Until the Jewish community <laughs> usually would, <clears throat> or when people were captured, you know, were, were captured by marauding armies. I mean, this was a, this was a real, this was a real problem. Now, this this never existed in Jewish law. Just put someone in prison. In fact, the whole idea of prison doesn't exist in Jewish law. The only time with a person was put in prison was if he was a threat to society, right? And he committed a crime or something, or, it, we, 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 no, or in between, or by trial, we were afraid he would, he would run away. But the way it worked was, he was captured, tried, punished. Bam, bam. There was no, whether it was lashes, capital punishment, whatever it was. There was no go to, go to prison for 20 years. That, that, that doesn't, uh, um, so, so, uh, so, so, so now, going back to our case, right? Where Ruvain, Ruvain borrowed money from Shevin. This is case study B, right? And he owes, and he owes money. The court can't force Shimon, you know, put him in prison. Now, what if now? What if Ruvain says, what, "What about this? Case? What if Ruvain says, if I don't pay you, I'll be, I'll, I'll become your slave." Are they allowed to make that contingent uh, a clause in the agreement? Is such a no. is such a clause valid? No. What you said earlier, we weren't. It was frowned upon, or something. It was very limited that people could sell them. Slaves. Well, that's that, that's in biblical Israel. <clears throat> it doesn't apply. Slavery has not applied since biblical Israel. I mean, in the Torah, slavery. Where man can solve himself, or whatever. Um, and so then, if we're talking about these two, then I'd have to say no, can't sell himself into slavery, or contractually obligate himself into slavery. Now, this this actually, by the way, happened in the town or city of Aragon in Spain. I don't know if it's the city still there. The land, I'm sure the land is. I mean, it's called something else now. This actually happened. This this was this was this case was put forth to a man named the Rivash. The Rivash is the name of the Yitzchak Ben Sheshes. He lived in the 1300s. And that so this guy borrowed money, and he said, "If I can't pay you back, I'll be your slave." Now the guy can't pay back. And I, obviously, when he made that clause, he never thought he wasn't going to pay back. But now, Shimon said, whatever, the, the, the lender says, nope. So let, let, let's look at the response. This is the second half, page 185. Uh, no, sorry, of, of, of 119, sorry. Text 12, second part of uh, the text. It says, Jewish law size removing the debtor. A person cannot be incarcerated. Why? But l l let me ask you a question. Is a person allowed to make an oath, a vow, or make an agreement that violates Torah law? 
Could a person make a vow that he is going to eat pig? Or no. that he's going to violate the Shabbos? You're looking no. at uh, what's the, what the Murano Jews did. I mean, and why? Well, didn't they convert in order to save themselves? And then. No, but their, their whole argument is. Around. But their whole argument was that the whole conversion was only a facade. Right. No, so okay. the, I, I, I'm not sure where you're going, but so the idea was, I, I was heading was, you cannot take an oath on an oath. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you promise to pay back the money, you say, I promise I'm not going to pay back the money. Well, sorry, you can't take an oath on an oath. That means we are already bound by Sinai that we have to do A, B, and C. You can't take an oath against that oath. So already by Sinai, God told us, that we worked for him, end, end statement, full stop. You can't go and say, if I don't pay back, I'll become a slave. You're, it's not, you're not given that liberty um, and it just, it, 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 to say that. It's an, unva it's an unvalid clause. Like he said, because the children of Israel belong to me as servants, um, it, 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 God says. Now, let's go on to another case. Where are we? Twenty-one, twenty-one. Yeah, but I think I'm there. Yeah. All right, let's 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 go on to um, let's let's go to was it number B? Uh, a case study B, right? Where the guy was contracted to work, can he quit? But look at text number thirteen. The Torah says, the Gemara says, the Gemara says that a worker has a right to withdraw. In the middle of the day, obviously we're talking about it over here, that the worker was contracted to work for the entire day. In the middle of the day, he um, he, 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 he pulled out. Go to the track, <laughs> right? See that? Want to go to the track? And he can't say, "Hey, you know, you signed the contract. You belong to me." That that whole that whole attitude is off because Jewish people don't belong to anyone. They uh, they belong to God. Now, what happens? What happens? This is going to answer the question: How much is he paid? And when it comes to payment, so the rush, uh, the, side, uh, the tour, Mediaka Ben Usher say, <coughs> says, an employee has the right to quit his job, and he's given the upper hand. What does that mean, the upper hand? It means even if, let's say, now it's going to cost going back to case study B. It's going to cost the landowner $45, meaning $15 an hour, not $10 an hour. We don't take out that extra money from the employee. <coughs> you're right. <laughs> it's not right or wrong. Even well, the Torah uh, says you can have a union. <laughs> nah. I, love, I love people that <laughs> you say something. Oh, you see the Torah agreement. <laughs> Not sure how you got there, okay. <clears throat> and for example, right, this is the example of pretty much case number B. You could, you, um, you could read, you could read the example. I mean, you do have the right to quit. Now, it, 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 but it's important to re-emphasize that just because you have the right to do something doesn't make it the right thing to do. Like I once heard a, a, a comic say, just because you could go skydiving doesn't make it a smart thing to do, right? Yeah, so don't go scared. No, I'm, I'm going to scare it. <laughs> I didn't say I was smart. So the point, the, the point is that, you know, the whole, it's, a, it's important to emphasize that in Allah, Allah tells you demands from you what you have to do. We spoke about a thing in lesson one, the concept of going beyond the letter of the law, doing the righteous thing, doing the proper thing. Now, obviously, if the guy gave his word, to work the entire day, he should work the entire day, because this guy is is rely is relying on him. Um, so the you know so the upper hand over here means that he gets his is ninety dollars. The lower hand would mean pretty much. What means we tell the employee that you gotta um, you gotta swallow the loss. Now, there's one little caveat over here. When the employee doesn't have the upper hand, when the employee is not going to get fully remunerated for his work. And that is if he's walking out now and 
it's going to cause the owner a revocable loss. It's not just loss of time. So let's say the work is started and it has to be continued done now. If not, everything's going to go to the garbage. So now we tell the employee, no, you can't leave. And if you leave, well, you can't leave. You can walk out, but it, uh, you, you're going to be the one to swallow, swallow the loss. Look at text number 15. He says, if the work was time sensitive and its neglect will cause irreversible damage, the quitting employee has the lower hand calculating the business. For example, workers hired to remove flax from water was soaking in. The flax is not punctually removed from the water, it will decay. If there are ex ex in extremely circumstances such as illness or death, like you were saying, um, Ira, mm -hmm. then he has the right, right? In the absence of such, such circumstances, the employee is given the lower end. Um, and because quitting prematurely will cause it, the employer uh, an irreversible loss. So, so you see the so we have over here that the terror is telling you the terror is telling you that you, you have obviously a responsibility to do the right thing, but no one owns you. When you when you work for somebody. When a, con when a person contract, what does he do? He's contracting his time, not his body. And, and um, because our bodies and our entire beings belong to God. So if you look at the exercise on page 124, if you think, what's the, be the greatest benefit of working for yourself? Greatest benefit of working for yourself? Call it out. No boss. No boss. Freedom. Greatest benefit of working for someone else? A pension at the end. Pension? Only someone who worked for the county can say that. Okay. Yeah. Pension? Okay. Greatest benefit of working for someone else? Yeah, exactly. Oh, I get one. Greatest benefit of work? Yeah, uh, uh, what did you say, Larry? Stability. You don't Stability. Stability. Uh, yeah, what's the biggest drawback of working for yourself? Instability. Instability, right? It means, you know, when you're self-employed, you, you know, uh, you, you have autonomy, you have freedom. Now you, you take care of your family. Every every yeah. one of your customers is your boss. That's right. Right. Um, and when and when you're and when you're um, the employee, what you know you you're making a what you're really doing is you're making a trade. A conscious trade. You're treating. You're, you're trading your freedom of time. Okay. You're saying I'm selling to you my time between nine and five. But you're you're trading that for freedom, right? The stability for freedom, right? You're, you're giving uh, now to avoid the person's body becoming a slave, or the person becoming a slave. We 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 give the employee. The clause, the right to quit, and therefore, um, therefore, he's never, he's never uh, afraid that he'll, he'll, he'll get caught up. But interestingly, by the way, it, no one brought this up. Do, is the law the same for employees and independent contractors? What if an independent contractor who quits? Them? They're not an employee. Okay, but what is it? What's the difference between an employee and an, and, and an independent contractor? Commitment. You have to commit. No, no. In, is it on? An independent contractor is really working for himself with a contract with the company. An employee works directly for the company. So the difference is, in other words, in other words. You, you, the employee you're paying him for his time. The contract you're paying you're paying him for his job. Right. Now, obviously, you want the employee to produce in a timely manner. And the contractor, you want him to finish a job in a timely manner. But it's different. It's very different. So look at text number 16. Rashi says the law is granting an employee the right to quit does not extend to independent contract. An employee is protected by the people by the by the clause in the verse that because you belong the employee belongs to God, not to the employer. 
but does not apply into independent contractors for the contractors serve themselves. Therefore, the contractor doesn't finish the job. And he says, hey, and I told you it would, it would take a year. I'm charging $120 and I work for nine months. Give me $90. Sorry. Now it's going to cost me $45 to get someone to finish a job. You're getting paid $75. So the independent contractor, his hand, his hand is on the, um, it's on, uh, is, is on, now, in the case in, um, in Britain, he was, he, um, he, was, he was an employee. So in our case, right, the guy who worked for nine months, he would get, he would get um, the $90. Right. Now, in American law, that's Jewish law. In American law, Mr. Britain gets $75. Because in America, it's a lot more employer employer focused than employee. They That's go, why we have unions. They, they you go to France, for example, the why employee owns the company. Very, very socialist. Yeah. So under US law, a person cannot be compelled to work and is, and is entitled to pay for partial work, but they don't have the right to quit at any time. You don't, if you give your contract, you can't just walk out. Judaism, however, gives a priority of the employer's, employee's freedom so as long as it don't, won't cause um, irretrievable loss to the employer, he can just uh, he can just walk out. Okay, let, let's finish off with one powerful point. Uh, four minutes to nine. Okay, let, 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 we're, we're, we're almost done. Very, very close. Let's really talk. Let's finish off with what really is uh, what freedom is. Let, let, let's go back. To, to, to what we're saying. So, every, so we now, we, we know this thing about freedom it's all over the world. Right? Uh, uh, let freedom ring. What the Torah is telling us when we're saying that we're, that we're, that we're God servants and we don't belong um, uh, to, to anyone else, what it really means is Hashem is telling you, you have the right to be you. You have the right to maximize to maximize um, your time. Now, don't be a servant to what, what other people tell you to do. That's a servant. If you go on Instagram, you know, for all your older folk, something called an influencer. Why? What? Because there are people, unfortunately, and buy something. Why? Because this person says it's popular. And these people are making millions of dollars by convincing other people to buy something because they say it's good. That's freedom. Freedom means you have the right to maximize your time. You have the right to be you. Like Rabbi Hoda Levy said, uh, Levy said, one of the poets, it's called the poet of the Jewish people. He said, he said, servants of time are servants of servants. Servants of God alone is free. Um, so what, what, is, what does it mean to be a servant, uh, in, to be a servant of time? Don't, servant, servant of, um, he's saying here, Hashem is telling you, be free from anyone. So be yourself. What's that line? It says, don't try to be someone else. Everyone else is taken. <laughs> now, unfortunately, we live in a society where everyone there's so much frustration because everyone's looking for contentment because they're looking instead of looking in the mirror, trying to be the best that then they can be. So looking, oh, what is that? How does that person say uh, say it's cool? And the Torah says that's that's slavery. That um, my it's be yourself. Everyone else is there. Be yourself. There you go. So be free from anyone. Um, be free from anything, and to be free, um, we must uh, we must be ourselves because we have to realize every single person there are no there are no mistakes in God's world. Every single person was put here for a reason. So try to maximize your own potential. Because remember, no matter what someone tells you, you, you can't be servant to anyone else. Your God's your, your God's special. Um, um, uh, uh, project. But next week, ownership is ownership and legal status. Um, 
we'll get, we'll get into ownership in your hands, ownership in, uh, in your mind. What, so meaning, if ownership is in the mind, can I take something from someone else under the assumption that they won't mind? And how far does the requirement go for me to return a lost item? So this is going to be good, good stuff. Next week. All right, key points. Take two, key points. Lesson four, beyond personal freedom. One, Judaism teaches that true freedom is living the life we were created to live. This requires freedom from human masters and devotion to God as the one true master. Two, in the past, people could be forced into slavery for failing to repay debts. Even today, prisoners can be legally compelled to work. By contrast, Jewish law does not allow for anyone to be compelled to work against their will. 3. Debt prison was another once ubiquitous tool for debt recovery. Jewish law has always banned debt prisons, even when stipulated in a loan agreement. 4. The employer-employee relationship requires an employee to surrender a certain degree of their freedom. Jewish law protects employees from veering too close to slavery by guaranteeing their right to quit mid-contract without penalty, unless doing so would cause the employer irretrievable loss. If you look at text, look at page 132, there's a map of debtor's prison. Um, looks like the United States, 1833, Canada, 1849, um, France, Germany around the same time. Greece, outlawed in 2008. Wow. I don't know if it's still practiced, but that's how prevalent the concept was. I mean, it's, it, it's so crazy to think that this was the people thought, but the ownership is interesting. Ownership is, is interesting. Because of uh, intellectual. Yep, intellectual ownership, right? And, we have, and especially these days, we're dealing with non, not um, tangible. Yeah. He's stealing, he's stealing an idea. Mm -hmm. What about downloading music? You know, Napster was it? Mm -hmm. Downloading music. Napster, yeah. Right? That's or maybe true. we can get into what the Chinese government does. If you want to sell to our market, you have to give us, you have to give us your, uh, right? Or what about what Amazon does? If you want to sell on Amazon, you have to give them the, uh, the how everything is made, whatever it is, officially to make sure and then they go and make their own mm -hmm. cheaper. I mean, it, it's a, a very, concept of ownership is very, very, uh... all right guys, next week, remember to buy your uh, yard side candles for Yisker. And Sunday, is, we mark the giving of the Torah, full dairy lunch. You're going to love it. It's going to be good stuff. You expect to see everyone or else. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. When you're coming over? Thursday. Thursday, you're coming over to use the torch. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just, just let me know a little bit before you get here. Okay. I'll, I'll let you know. Oh, okay, guys. All the best. Best. Good night.